Yeah, absolutely. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, I probably, like a lot of people, uh, started to get interested in art when I was at school. Um, I was I was good at art, and I was also um, relatively good at. Um, I was an academic student as well, so it was a. I, I always had this kind of issue of whether or not to focus on art or whether to go a conventional route into um, sixth form college and and so on to become an accountant like my dad would have liked. But I really liked drawing and painting when I was in my early teens. Um, we had various books around the house of art history and I used to just copy old Cubist paintings and things like that. So I, I really enjoyed the activity of art and creating images. Um, and art was my favorite subject at school and O-level art was um, something that I really enjoyed doing. Um, and then towards the end of uh, my final year in school, I went to visit Barnsley College of Art and Design, which I'd never really heard of. I'm from Barnsley, by the way, which is in South Yorkshire. Um, and the art college I thought was great. So um, I decided to apply to go and do a BTEC in, uh, in art and design instead of going to sixth form college, uh, which again, you know, caused a huge consternation with my with my dad and my family, but we argued our way through it and I won the argument and I went to Barnsley Art College. So that was that was the point at which I realised that my interest and love for art could become a career, that there were there was somewhere to go. There was a university route to go down. That's amazing. So the, um, was there much uh, exposure to design um, fat then? Was it much more of a focus on art as a, and design as a, as a, you know, as a whole. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good question. I've been thinking about this because we, when I got to the art college, all I wanted to do was draw and paint and do printmaking. Um, but they had a really rigorous and intensive history of history of art and design uh, syllabus, and we were taught from day one. This is when I was sixteen, going on seventeen. We were taught about the history of design and the modern movement. We were taught about modernism and postmodernism. Um, and Memphis and the international style and so on. We were also taught about the history of art, but it's where it, it's where I became, um, uh, it's where I was shown lots of information about architecture, about graphic design, product design, industrial design, all these things I'd never considered before. I mean, I just thought that painting and drawing was the way in to the career. So it was it was through the it was through the academic side of the art course, if you like, that I started to learn about all these design movements and understand that there were these things, these people called designers and architects, um, who were doing different things in the world. Yeah, that's interesting because that was quite similar for me. That there was, and I, I sort of retrospectively, retrospectively look back at that in anger at times because it, there wasn't all these breakdowns of design courses that you can get now. But I think in, in hindsight, having all of those influences like photography, art, processing different bits and pieces and being involved even not fashion design was part of our course. I think that really yeah. helped in the long term because you were you know, you're opened to a wider world. Wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, on that course, they were really opening us up to all the different disciplines. Mm. So I did, yeah, I did fashion as well and textiles and you know, all sorts of things that I've probably forgotten now. So to trying out different disciplines. Yeah. And it was only towards the end of that course when I was um, 18 that I started to think about what I wanted to specialise in. Um, and that's when I started to look around the country at colleges. Um, and I came across Ravensbourne College, which at that time was in Chislehurst in South East London, which, um, which was really different to all the other colleges that I'd looked at. Um, in that it, it had, it seemed to have a really strong point of view about what graphic design was and what visual communication was. And I didn't quite understand it at the time. And I didn't know too much about Swiss typography and the international style, but I could tell that, that the graphic design that they produced there and the students that, that went there were working in a slightly austere way. I thought it was a bit more... Uh, intellectual stroke academic then you know it, it definitely wasn't a fine art course or an illustration course it was pure visual communication um so um i applied i applied for that course and was accepted and i did three years um at ravensbourne and what i found out when i started there was that it had been modeled on 
the Ulm School of Design um, from the 70s and the 80s, which was which had been loosely modelled on the Bear House. So it, it was all about um, typography, uh, craft, layout, mm. the use of negative space and, you know, and so on and so forth. So it was we, we were given a kind of Swiss typography education. Um, and for the first for the first term, you know, we weren't allowed to use color or anything. It was just black and white, black squares on a white square and moving black squares and rectangles around a page and looking at um, looking at structure and form and composition. So it was a, it was really back to basics, quite severe um, and and really quite rigorous. Yeah, that, that's so I think that's so clear in the work you do with Studio Blackburn now, but that, that's um you know the Bauhaus and the typography and the Swiss sort of stuff it's when it's just me it seems to be it sort of shines through but at that time was that were you thinking what the hell's going on here was this like oh well you know when you use colour I want to sort of be really expressive and, and other things or was it quite clear that that was to help you understand the craft it was it was definitely clear that it was to help us understand the craft it was also the late 1980s so we had what like there was one computer in the, for uh, 120 students. So it was at that time when things were just on the turn. And we were looking at design studios around London that were using Apple Macs and were, used, were doing des you know, desktop publishing was a new term. And we were getting slightly worried that the course was teaching something that wouldn't be relevant when we, when, when we graduated. Um, you know, that the agencies wouldn't be needing uh, graduates that could do artwork and markup and all that stuff um, anymore. So there was a frustration in terms of, uh, uh, we felt like it was the last days of that type of education, but we also saw the value in it. Um, I really saw the value. I liked the, the tutors that we had. Um, you know, some of them had worked as part of the 1972 um, Olympics Otto Likers team. So there was a connection back to real, you know, really real high points in design history. Um, and I really liked that side of it, but I was also anxious about about leaving college and having something that was relevant for for the new world that was emerging yeah. uh, for graphic designers. Yeah, was there any around that time uh, personal or cultural influences that were design led? You know, sort of, you know, record club covers have always traditionally been <laughs> that sort of outlet, haven't they, for for the youth? I suppose at the time, you know, we've all gone through those sorts of you know, finding ourselves. Haven't we? But at that time, did you? Could you relate to anything that was anything driving your you know, your love of design? Do you know what? Not really. No, I mean, I sort of, um, I've met other people from that era who were obsessed with, you know, factory records, um, the stuff that Peter Savile was doing. Um, but it wasn't me, to be honest. It's a funny thing. I mean, I've, you know, embarrassingly, I've had this sort of very long association with, um, of liking Paul Weller. But at that time, it was the it was the dying days of the Style Council, so there were that wasn't much of an influence in terms of graphic design, to be quite honest. Um, so no, not really. I was more interested in design history and what was going on across Europe. There were some uh, there were some really good agencies. Studio Dunbar in in Holland at that time were doing very distinctive work. Um, so we were always and obviously APO, uh, who we were closely aligned to. At, um, at Ravensbourne, um, Hamish used to teach at Ravens, Ravensbourne. So there was, we were conscious of that work that was going on. So I was, I was interested in the graphic design as, aspect of it, um, but no, not really culturally, no. to be honest. Maybe uh, with the Style Council, go back to your, yeah, your fashion education that might be there, more of a, <laughs> more of a link than design. Um, moving from on from Ravensbourne, was did you then step into into the industry straight from there? Or was there another? No, but, you know? no, I went. I, I went to do a, a master's in graphic design at, at what was then Central St. Martins, um, which was in Longacre, right in the centre of London in Covent Garden, um, which was, which I'm really glad that I did. I mean, I didn't learn anything about graphic design. It was, it, it was a completely different type of course to Ravensbourne. Um, we, were, we were prompted to go out around London and experience things, theatre, music, art and so on and so forth and we were really well placed to do that um, and to discuss what was going on and we had this really unusual set of tutors which um, included John Barnbrook who'd been out of college for a couple of years and 
John Warricker, who just started Tomato. There's about half a dozen tutors like that who were all working. So we were able to, to talk to them about what was going on um, and the direction that design was going in. So it was really fruitful in that in that respect. It was really an informative time to be at St. Martin's and really exciting. I really enjoyed it. But I didn't learn much about graphic design and I didn't do very much good graphic design either, as I remember. What was the general sort of gist of what they were teaching them, was it? They they were they wanted us to um they, they used to describe it as adding to the body of knowledge so that you know could graphic design uh do something for the world um that was unusual or unexpected um could you take it in a direction that hadn't been that hadn't been done before and at that time it was it was the very end of um the demise of the the coal industry um and at, and at that time i was really connected to uh, South Yorkshire, um, where I'm, where I'm from, uh, and I was really interested in uh, in politics at the time. So uh, my my MA thesis and production was a book about the demise of of the coal industry and what happens to an area when the reason for it being there in the first place is is no longer there. And what happened in this country was there were these places like Barnsley, and you'll know them yourself. You know the places in the Midlands as well that have grown up around an industry um, and that industry was was closed down. So there's no reason for 200,000, a town of 200,000 people being there anymore. So my I produced this book called um, Overpowered and Undermined. I think the title might have been the best bit about it, but it was a sort of observation of, of what had happened and interviews. I went and I went and interviewed a lot of the people who had been involved in the, in the strike um, in the early 80s. Um, I, and I got to meet people from the women's groups which had emerged from the strike. It had really empowered women uh, in certain areas to start their own groups um, and, to, um, and they went on to become different types of protest movements. So it was an interesting area for me to be involved in. But graphic design was almost an afterthought. Yeah, well, that must have been really beneficial in again in hindsight for like, the sort of storytelling that we try to do don't we through branding and you know we use design for today a lot of you know even if it's for commercial gain that's that idea of using design to you know to represent a community or you know a, a social decline must have been or did it not feel like that at the time did it feel a bit like oh again a bit like the ravens one thing are we at the end of are we not necessarily doing what we thought we signed up yeah it it did feel it did feel significant, actually, and it was it was really beneficial to me learning how to take a comp. Essentially, it's learning how to take a very complex story and present it to the world in a in an articulate and coherent way. I think that's been really useful, and I think I I think I do that. I think we do that now. Yeah. I'm not sure I realised at the time that how useful it would be, but that's that's what it enabled me to do. I was I, I remember chatting to a lot of lots of photographers around that time um there was a guy called paul reese who was a wonderful documentary photographer um in the style of sort of kind of in the style of martin parr but you know observational photography um and my my work in barnsley did were involved that as well so i took i did lots of uh, photography and photographs so it was kind of it was it was that idea of observing and then documenting and then presenting it in a way that could be easily digested. So that idea of understanding the means of communication is is something that I was learning then. And I think that's really uh, I think that that's really come through, especially in recent years. Yeah, I think also that that's it'd be a good project for anybody starting out, I imagine, because that sort of those clusters of that, that happening across the country is, is like continual, isn't it? When we talk about Sunderland before we came on, you know, with the iron industry and then in the Midlands with automotive, you know, there's quite a lot of those that you know you could be a self-initiate project. I imagine it's really sort of educational as well as sort of yeah to be ingrained in the, that culture of a place, isn't it? especially when you're where you're from. Yeah, exactly. And I mean I was I was saying to you before we, we've ended up doing a lot of work in Sunderland um and in Newcastle. And it's not because I ever wanted 
to work in that area. I've got, you know, I just didn't didn't know the area at all. But we were asked to pitch um, about ten years ago for a, a, an inward investment campaign that Sunderland wanted to do to attract investment into the area uh, from different parts of the world, and we we won that pitch. And I think part of me getting to know Sunderland City Council really benefited from the fact that I that I was from well, first of all, I was from Barnsley, not even though we're based in London. Um, but I understood what a post-industrial town and city uh, feels like. And I, I understood some of the pressures on that place and some of the, I guess, some of the politics and the intricacies. Mm. And I found it also very sort of rewarding, you know, to get involved with a place that is obviously undergoing uh, regeneration and really trying to reinvent itself. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, isn't it? For like what we do as a, as a, for a living, for paying clients or for, you know, for whoever it might be. Is that it's not always necessarily just winning uh, pitches for the sake of it. It's about having a connection to what's actually you're trying to achieve. Isn't it? I think that's really important. Maybe sometimes gets lost. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I worked for a while in a really sort of corporate environment. I worked at Landor um, and I worked at Imagination. When when I worked at Landor, these these briefs would come in from companies that you'd never heard of, or, you know, or companies that are huge global entities. And I, I like the intellectual challenge of getting to know them and understanding what their problems were. Mm. Um, so the, I, I always try and find kind of meaning for any client that we work with. You know, and, and mostly I think you can. And it becomes really like part, part of the interest becomes getting to know the people and understanding what drives them. Mm. But there is something extra about doing you know doing work for an area like Sunderland where at times we look at it and we think god we are actually having a positive effect here for people who really do need something positive to happen yeah. and that's so that there's an extra there's an extra bite to that I think yeah and that's generally doesn't necessarily come with the, the financial sort of side of it it's that emotional side isn't it? now again it's this yeah. thing that we claim to sort of do for others that we don't sometimes we don't always look at it for ourselves do we so when you get yeah. that and you have that sort of um, you know that, that pride in your work because if it's if it truly has affected somebody else's life it's a, it's a it's a very rewarding sort of place to be isn't it absolutely yeah and it, it's taken it's taken me a long time to sort of hone the set of clients that we've got i mean it's changing all the time and i think some of it is just realizing what I actually enjoy and the types of clients that I enjoy working with. And I think it, I, I think automatically you start, you know, you, there's this kind of automatic filter that starts to take place yeah. um, where clients that you're interested in can see your enthusiasm. Um, and, and that tends to work really well. And also we, we go after clients as well. I mean, I've, um, we, we did a, we did a rebrand for this, organization called positive positive news who are a, they're a constructive journalism uh, journal magazine they come out four times a year and i i just heard them talk being interviewed on radio four one morning um and i thought god that sounds really good and i'd never heard this phrase constructive journalism before which is basically uh you know there are good things happening it's not all gloom and doom although you wouldn't think that at the moment but um so I just got in touch with them, you know, and I chased them down. And out of that, we were put on the pitch list to rebrand them and, and we won it. But I think the fact that I was interested in them really helped in that pitch situation. Yeah, 100%. You just mentioned two places that you previously worked at. What After um, Central yeah. St. Martins, was that then the catalyst to step into industry? Not really, no. I, I, I had a few years of zigzagging a little bit. I did... Um, and I did some things that I'm that I was slightly embarrassed about at the time. I worked at a place called Dolling Kindersley, which is a children's book publisher, and it's where you know um, uh, the the style of it was you know of the work that they produce was um, was not great. But I did a children's atlas. Weirdly, I've got it somewhere, and it. But uh, I had a great time doing it, you know, because I really like the the whole thing of designing all the pages for it for an atlas and we worked with uh, cartographers which was great so I did six months there and then I went to work at a really lovely studio called this it was called the Square Red Studio um, and it was out in uh, North Kensington and they 
they'd come out of the sort of late seventies music scene. They, the two guys that run it, Marcus and Tony, had been sort of in-house team for um, uh, Richard Branson's record company, and they'd done Sex Pistols covers and things like that. Um, and I went and sort of lodged at their studio for a while, and with a guy called Rupert Bassett, and together we did. Uh, we we spent a summer designing a new prospectus for Ravensbourne College, which we were also teaching at as well. So that was that was 1994, and that was brilliant because I just we just took our time and drank lots of coffee and <laughs> sat around looking at reading books about Ottolica and stuff. And uh, but we during that process, it was um, you know we I, I didn't feel any pressure. It was like free, we were freelancing. Um, I didn't particularly want to work for anyone, um, and we just did this project, and it was it was a really good outcome. I think I think the the prospectus you should look it up. It's really nice bit of work. I think in retrospect, is that available uh, online? Is it? It was. It probably is online somewhere. It's um, it was in a book called Typographics by Roger Walton, which is quite old, and um, there was a lot of Ravensbourne students. Funnily enough. Uh, People like uh, Ben and Paul, who went on to create Made Thought, and Daniel Etok, who I've since be become, you know, really good friend of mine, they all applied to Ravensbourne around that time of that prospectus, and uh, some of them have even said that, that it kind of prompted them to yeah. apply to Ravensbourne. So it was all, you know, within two or three years of of, um, of them starting that we were doing that work. Yeah. That's not a bad roll call, is it, for to have inspired people to create sort of like made thought and, and others. That's the. I don't. Yeah, I I, I don't want to take yeah. an ounce <laughs> more credit than I'm due for that. I tell you. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll celebrate it. It's, it's all down to you. Uh, we won't tell. <laughs> just don't tell them. That. They probably won't watch. Um, no, they, I, I do know Ben and Paul. They won't mind. Yeah, what was the uh, the landscape like in '94 for design compared to sort of you know the minimalist that you experienced at, at the start a lot in the eight, late '80s in Ravensbourne? Well, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I mean, people were telling me at the time that the market was tired of Swiss typography, whatever that meant. There were people like John Barn. I mean, the, the people in the design news, the graphic design news, were you know, it was John Barnbrook, Tomato, Why Not? Um, and and it was quite, you know, I, I don't know how to describe that word really. It's quite post mod, quite post modern. You know, uh, Tomato always had this, they always had this thing of uh, trying not to define what they were, you know, and let others define it. I found it quite confusing. I certainly didn't know where I fit, where to fit in. Mm. Um, and I think having that Ravensborn um, Swiss type of like minimalist approach to fall back on was quite handy because I could do things and I could get freelance work and I could pop into places and do work. But the, the real, the real shift came, I think, when when North were created. I think that that caused a step change at the time uh, in 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 graphic design because they kind of straddled the art side of what graphics and branding could be, but they were also commercially successful from the off. You know, they they were able to compete with the old fashioned branding agencies. Mm. Yeah, I seem vaguely from the bits I do remember, it's very much a hedonistic sort of time, wasn't it? You know, with you know from a politi political perspective, you know, with New Labour and you know the musical sort of scenes and all that sort of. It was quite a yeah. brash sort of in your face sort of period, wasn't it? It's very colourful it, and you know loud. I think so. Yeah, I'm trying to think back. I really, I, I, I always like the work of North because they they stood back and did tried to do really very minimal work as and i think it was a reaction to all that yeah. um but god you're asking me i can't remember it so yeah. it feels like a lifetime ago uh, well, i can hardly remember last week so i was a stupid question <laughs> to get me involved with something like that is that what led to the, the inception of the creation should i say of your studio what was the modern force behind that well there are two things i think the the Previously to Studio Blackburn, I was five years at a company called Greenspace. Um, and Greenspace had been set up by Adrian Caddy, who had been my creative director at Imagination. And he set up this company 
called Greenspace on his own. He asked me to come in as a partner and a director. And we in we we had this project to redesign Toyota across Europe. So it's a huge corporate identity project, which I went in and um, and and helped him with. And we ran Greenspace for five years. And and towards the end of that time, uh, I was just exhausted and burnt out um, for various reasons. And also I realized, I think retrospectively, that I just wanted to be in charge of a company myself without a partner, without anyone else and do my own thing. That wasn't clear to me at the time, but that's that's what's become clear since. So I, I left Greenspace in 2000 and. 11 and I set up Studio Blackburn immediately um, August 2011 uh, and I had one I had one client you know and I was back uh, after having run a company of 30 people at Greenspace um, I was back to uh, being in, in my bedroom with one client didn't last very long but uh, you know quickly got out of my bedroom uh, but that 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 was the immediate impetus for setting setting up Studio Blackburn but the other driving idea behind it was that I'd I'd worked at I'd worked at North with Sean for a year as a freelancer in about 2005, um, and and I'd found that really inspiring. And I think I I don't know if Sean Perkins will watch this, but if he does, he'll be wincing because I'm always going on about how good I think he is, and he's not the type of bloke to really enjoy that sort of platitude. Um, but uh, but it was really I, I really liked it because when you work, when you go into the North Studio, everything is about design. Like it, and Sean lives for design, and it was the first time I'd been in an agency where everything was about the best quality graphic design that you could possibly do. Um, and if you went out for dinner with Sean, you'd go to like the best Japanese restaurant and you'd talk about graphic design and Japanese food and all this stuff. So it was a real, I really liked that atmosphere and I really liked how he organised his, his company. And I think when I started Studio Blackburn, that's probably all I had in mind really, that this has got to be a company that is my thing to suit me so that I can employ people that I think are brilliant, um, whose company I enjoy and so that we can have an environment and an atmosphere that is really focused on uh, on design that we all like and creativity that we all like. Mm. But what's the what, what's the reality of having that sort of history or that early stage? We say in, in design with such a being surrounded by people and, and education, which is focused on the craft and the quality and the, yeah, but finding the best possible solution to then being sat in a bedroom with one client, selling yourself to anybody, I presume, to get enough money to stay afloat. Yeah, it wasn't quite that desperate, to be honest. The um, so we've I've never had. I mean, I, the client I had was a good client, and within a month, within a couple of months, I had I had Sage, you know, like global software client. So, um, I the quality level I don't think ever dropped. There were some we we we've done projects definitely over the last ten years where we've gone down the wrong rabbit hole, you know, and it's not um and it's always been oh maybe we shouldn't have taken that on. Or maybe we, maybe that just wasn't the right project for us, or a client's gone bad, you know, and all that sort of stuff that happens. Um, but probably for the first month of Studio Blackburn, I thought, well, look, I've got a client; it's a decent client. Uh, lots of people know who I am and were contacting me, and it quickly gathered pace. Um, and I was back to being stressed and burnt out within 12 months <laughs> on, the, on the topic of burnout you mentioned obviously that a couple of times there what does that look like for you because I've had this this has been a sort of a common theme in a lot of these conversations that we've had so much so that we're going to have a specific one dedicated to it later this year yeah but I it, think you should I think it's a big thing in yeah. this in this industry and I, I think, think it's sorry, sorry I think it's it looks slightly different for a lot of different people, even though it's really, it, it has a similar sort of traits. Was there anything you know, in, in the experiences that you had that you, that were um, a catalyst for why that happened or was it just purely the, the, the pressure of the industry needing need to you know, fulfill briefs and clients needs and all those sorts of things? Yeah, well, all of that, I guess, but I think there's a danger. Um, I, I think if you're if you're good at solving problems, which is a lot of what we do, and I think if you're 
I think if you're good at taking, I think if you demonstrate that you can take complex problems and handle them and you can handle complexity and you can make sense out of them and you can create something that a client couldn't create, which is kind of why they pay us to do it. Um, it's very easy to, to get into a rhythm of saying yes to everything because it's, you can demonstrably do things and you can handle lots of, lots of complexity. But what you're unable to really perceive is where your limit is. Um, and you, because how could you? And I think with me, burnout occurs. It just, it, it's, it's probably happened two or three times and it's crept up unnoticed because I've, I never feel that I'm reaching my limit and I'm used to handling lots of projects and lots of clients all at once. And I handle clients and I handle staff and there's lots of things going on at the same time. And I tend not to be phased by that, but there is obviously a limit to that. And I think it's impossible to know where it is. And that's the danger. So mentally that's how burnout happens and that's the process yeah. um how it's affected i've experienced myself as well it just happens doesn't it that's it. it's not that you know it's just yeah. it's impossible to say it's boiling point isn't it and you just yeah it just pops I, I i watch for it in other people all the time you know i'm very conscious of it with with people that i employ and people that i collaborate with because that that's another area where um you know people demonstrate what they can do and of course it's difficult to think, right, well, uh, at what point are they going to go pop? You know, at what, what can they handle? What, what's too much? Yeah, it's, yeah, a, okay. it's a tricky one. There's no simple answer to it other than, and that's why I think it's a good idea that, you're, that you've got to sort of, um, to have a series of these focused on that mental health stuff because um, the only way to combat it is to discuss it and talk about it. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's one of the big issues, isn't it? It's still quite stigmatised in that, in that respect. You know, it's getting better, but I think especially in our in our industry, the, the, we we cater for and look after clients, you know, because it pays us pays us to, to you know to keep us afloat. But there's yeah. very rarely, or I've, my experiences are very rarely like sort of look after our own well being, and we sort of, especially in a, a digital world where you know we, you can get private messages from all over the place at all any time of the day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We, we sort of succumb to that sort of service sort of type of industry, don't we? And it's um, you know, we think we need to look after ourselves primarily, and then that that Absolutely. will allow us then to serve other people better. Yeah, yeah. Which is the dream, isn't it? That's the whole. That's what we, that's why most people start to go freelance or work for themselves because that's what they 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 love that idea of having control, aren't they? And be able to be the masters of their own destiny. But sometimes we sort of let the business side of it sort of dictate. Yeah, I think I think this is something that ought to be discussed more, by the way, because I think some people are suited to freelance and some aren't. And I think being master of your own destiny um, is is quite a dangerous thing for some people. It, the idea is great, but the reality is different. That if 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 you're the person, if if you're someone that really struggles with the idea of of getting work in then you're going to struggle as a freelancer. You know, if it, if it affects you mentally, then it's, then it's not what you should be doing. Some people are much better suited to being in a stable, employed environment. Um, so I think it's, um, I'm, you know, it's, you, you kind of give with one hand and take with another. I mean, I love the fact that I've got an agency that is producing work that I think is, uh, I mean, I love the work that we do and it's a, I love the fact that we're building a body of work that I'm really proud of. But there's a downside to that, which is I'm always stressing about the next client. You know, I mean, it's it's a nightmare. And then they all bloody come at once anyway. You know? <laughs> it happens every time, doesn't it? It's yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to compare it to buses, but it's bloody annoying. Um, as the studio built, what was that like? In the, you know, obviously it's over a long period of time, but the, the process of having your own philosophy, going out on your own, got a reputation, so you start to generate, you know, um, you know the, the people coming to you and you're approaching others. What was the first stages of, of building a team, a culture that they, uh, you know, that they, um, they loved and wanted to be part of? And then also, yeah. the, the, the more, there's a few questions in one here, but the building the multidisciplinary sort of side of it as well, because on your site, there's a lot of skills that you, you guys provide. Yeah. Was that, how did that all you know, sort of come about? Well, the first, I, I guess the first phase was 
um, was with a guy called Sam Moffat, who um, I'd, had freelanced for me at Greenspace. Um, and when I started Studio Blackburn, on when we got the first job in, um, I asked him and another guy called uh, um, Matthew Fenton, who would, had also worked for me at Greenspace, uh, who's a brilliant designer. They're both brilliant designers. They're both freelance for me for a while. Um, Matthew went off to do something else. Um, and Sam really wanted to continue what we, what we were doing. And he became creative director sort of instantly. Um, and he worked in a really cool, modernist way. I mean, his work's lovely, continues to be lovely. So um, we, we worked for a few years together and he really drove the look and feel, which I, I sort of described as a, it's a little bit like total design. You know, it's a bit like contemporary modernism, if you like. Um, and Sam really loved that work, you know, Wim, Wim Crowell and all that stuff. So the first few years were really built by me and Sam, me winning the work and guiding the work and doing all the client stuff um, and, and Sam creating, you know, doing the graphic design. Um, and then we got Rebecca Cole in, who's still with us um, as an account director. So myself, Sam and Rebecca sort of led everything um, for, for quite a while. And then beyond that, we just brought in people that we thought were really great. Yeah, how is that for anybody that's listening, that's uh, thinking, you know, they've got to maybe they've established a, a small agency, a one-man team. The process of then taking that jump to you know, bringing somebody in, is that based, or well, for you, was that based upon revenue forecasts? Was it based upon what you'd already amassed in the kitty? Was there a, a you had a, a line of people, uh, clients already yeah. in place? Was that, because that's it's a big, big jump, isn't it? Um, yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, so, I guess so. I mean, I'd, and I don't know if how interested people are in this, but the way that I run the business is with I, I have a forecast. I have a kitty that never gets high enough. Um, I have a I have a client pipeline, if you like. I'm all you know. I so in in my forecast, I, I look forward six months, and I have all the client work in that is that I know is signed off, and then below that, I have all the possible work. So these are clients that I'm talking to on an ongoing basis or new clients or new business. And that all adds, you know, I put in made up figures for that. So I have an actual figure and of what we've got coming in. And then I have a prospective figure and that's how I look at it. So then I think, well, for the actuals, this size team is what I need. But if all that work comes in, then I need to have a reserve team ready to go. Yeah, that's um, good way of doing it. And I'm really conscious of time, Paul. And probably going to jump forward a little bit here. And, I, and we, we've talked briefly on this already about wellbeing and then just the team. There was a campaign that you did that I really liked. I'm not just saying that because you're here, but I generally liked um, about the women green. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you've been asked about this a million times, but I'm fascinated to know more about the, how you deal with potentially the negative impact of what, what let's say the ignorant, I would say, yeah. uh, the comment online about things that I don't really have any understanding about. They're not, interesting in reading the case study they don't go and actually read the you know the yeah. industry um uh, there's a there's a, yeah there's a few aspects to this i mean that like first of all um that we we didn't turn that logo green without having a conversation internally about what this about how this might annoy people yeah. but you know it's not and i don't think it was that I don't think it was an original idea. It was just, it felt like the right thing to do for a campaign. The other thing is that logo had been turned multicolors in a few years ago by MNC Saatchi. So it wasn't even the first time it had been played around with. But anyway, we did a, we turned the logo green and we came up with a line, we mean green. And that was a result of a, a kind of strategy piece that we'd done with our client, Rail Delivery Group, where they were at pains to say to us that they really believed this. You know, they really believed that if people switch to the railways instead of using lorries and cars, it has an it, it has a positive effect. And here are the facts and figures that prove it. So it's, this is an authentic message, first of all, that we were putting out. And I thought it was all right. You know, I didn't think it was a, the best bit of advertising or campaign ever, but I thought it was a decent piece of work. Um, the Guardian then went and waved it in front of 
Gerald or whatever it's called, and um, who and got some sound bite out of him, and then and then ran it, and then and then the design world went mental, mm. and and it it was it was interesting because for twenty four hours it was quite unpleasant. I mean, in in all honesty, it didn't bother me that much because I've stopped being worried by people criticizing our work. But the the team who'd worked on it, you know, the young, it's like it's their first experience of um, of having anything out in the press, and and it was it 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 felt a bit like tin hats on for for a day. So I just tried to uh, reassure everyone that it would blow over, mm. which it would have done. But then twenty four hours later, um, Mark Ritson uh, decided that he liked it, and then everyone else decided they liked it after that. Mm. So. Um, so that kind of really worked in our favour, you know, and we got we got loads of brilliant PR out of it. I got 60,000 views on LinkedIn, you know, of, of like reading the thing that we'd put out. Yeah. But is it, is it infuriating that if you actually take, it's not even a big amount of time, you know, five minutes to read the proper press release, not just what you guys have written um, from a case perspective, but more even there was a lot of... Um, yeah, there's a lot of words written by industry figures you know, representing him rail, weren't there? And I read most of them. Yeah. It, it came within the opening paragraph. It was quite clear what the campaign represented and what it was about. Is that sort yeah. of side of what, what you do or what we do as an industry? Is that, do you find that inf infuriating or is that, you, you know, you've been around too long to sort of care anymore? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it, it, I don't find it infuriating, but I do find it strange um, that the, the debate around graphic design and branding is is pretty thin compared to other industries i mean i'm interested in architecture and i'm interested in product design there's a much bigger debate going on in those disciplines about their discipline within the discipline so i i think um you know graphic design and branding there's there doesn't seem to be much conversation not that i'm aware of um i mean perhaps uh, and and that's what that's what i was trying to say I, I don't want to criticize design week because I've, I've ended up in a conversation with the editor of design week because, because they just went out and did a box pop and asked these designers to comment on that green logo. So, you know, I mean, what are people going to do if they're asked to comment, they're just going to, they're going to take an opportunity to have a pop, which is what most of them did. Yeah. And I, it, the, the problem there is design week, you know, it's the responsibility of the, um, yeah. they've got a responsibility to frame the discussion properly and make sure people are informed. So if, if the debate is going to go down the sort of like hello magazine type approach, then that's where we're heading as an industry. But if it, it, it ought to be elevated, I think, um, and it ought to be discussed seriously and sensibly. Um, and there's too much of a disconnect between, you know, high design and brand design and all this stuff. You know, it needs to be, um, there, there ought to be a much more, vigorous discourse in my opinion mm, yeah and i've said this for quite a long time myself about this this a nature of quite elitism in design at times when there's certain people because of the stature they you know they can direct the conversation to suit their needs or they get you know the, they get the publicity because of who they are not necessarily because of what they produce which is yeah. quite infuriating and i'm really concerned about the you know, future generations stepping into it, that sort of that may be sort of that's all they'll know. And this idea that yeah. like Design Week will just create, you know, sort of, um, create some sort of ill feeling to, amongst us because yeah. it's, it's what drives you know, likes and views and ultimately revenue and all that other horrible sort of stuff as opposed to being. It, I, yeah, I must say, by the way, and I really, I really don't want to criticize Design Week about this at all because they've been, they've been good since and I, they've decided not to do that type of vox pop anymore yeah. and they've decided to inform people about what they're commenting on before they give people the chance to to comment i mean some of some of the designers that commented on it were given a platform they were young themselves you know it's the first time they've been given an opportunity to say anything and i think that i think that i think the industry needs to be a bit more responsible about thinking about their careers as well you know yeah, and, then, and, and it's, like I say, what, the reason why I led that, com that question is because of what we're talking about with well-being, and that's you know that's such a, a 
an incredible part of that, isn't it? Is that you know, you've got to be conscious about the people that are behind this, and not just about yeah. creating sensational headlines. But uh, well, yeah, no, I'm yeah. Glad it sort of. I just I really felt the need to wanted to talk about that because um, it's something I felt quite strongly at the time. Um, last question, really, Paul. Paul before we um, finish this, uh, there's a lot of talk about people focusing on a specific discipline or niche within the, the wider design world. And as, as I was saying before on your, your website, you, there's a, a lot of disciplines that you guys are specialised in. Is that, where do you sit on that? Do you think that people should open their eyes up to a lot of different things and try and try out different things all the time? Or is, 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 or is it dependent on, I suppose, the stage of your career? Is it better to focus on one thing at a time? Um, well, to, to, to begin where you began with the, the different disciplines on our website, I, I feel um, in the last two or three years that the, the team that I've got can do, they can do what you might term high design. You know, they can do really great looking graphic design, but they can also animate and they can also understand how social media works and they can understand, they understand how messaging and marketing works and so on. So they're, they, I, I consider them specialists, but they're, but they're definitely multidisciplinary as well. They've got quite a few, there's quite a few things that they're really good at at the same time. And obviously moving graphics, um, I think has been driven by the market anyway. So we are, the, the designers that seem to be coming through can design and then they can make it move. That's my simple description of what they do. Um, and I think that's driven by what they're seeing out there and that's what the market wants, right? So that's, that's really good. I mean, that's, that's really helped me in terms of develop in terms of developing new business and being able to show potential clients what we can do in a really engaging way. So that's definitely changed. So if that's if that's what you mean by being multidisciplinary, then then I would encourage that. I I also think understanding the different softwares is really important. Being able to operate in different software um, is is super important. Yeah. And and that's what we look for in, in designers. But beyond beyond that, I mean, in my career, because uh, I've done a lot of 3D experiential stuff as well, so motor shows and events um, and interiors and so on. So I've learned, I've really enjoyed learning about that. But there's a point at which I feel my expertise is is not as great, you know, and it's not it's not as keen. And we, uh, I always need to partner with people. But we, I've done some weird things, you know. We did we did Formula One cars at green space you know i did a designed a, a livery for a formula one for a formula one car you know th stuff like that so you can find yourself doing things that your mum and dad understand you know which is quite nice i suppose that's the difference though isn't it between a business and an individual is that the business you know it, it, it offers a, a wider range of service but as an individual you might be specifically talented in one area more than another so you sort of as a business you're building a team around people that have yeah. specific skills, haven't you? I suppose that's the big difference. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, that's really good. I really, really appreciate that, Paul. Um, again, I always say this conscious of the time, we, it skips by so fast. Um, Pleasure. Could have uh, spoke for another hour at least. Um, but that's uh, great to know more about yourself and, and the studio. I hope everyone else has uh, enjoyed enjoyed what has uh, been been said. Um, we'll get this onto YouTube in a couple of weeks, so it becomes open to a wider, you know, people. Um, a yeah. wider audience um but yeah no i really appreciate your time paul i hope you have a great uh, weekend ahead and uh thank you very much all the best to you in the studio and the team yeah and i, I just want to say thanks to stuart goff who i can see is on this call and has been staring directly at me <laughs> for the duration nice to see you oh there we go <laughs> Yeah. Some little, little giggle at that so brilliant well, we'll end that it's always a bit abrupt this part paul it's um, end it for everybody but uh, like i say great to speak to you and hopefully catch up again soon okay pleasure thanks very okay. much thank you